Welcome to Cleaning Your Financial Closet. My name is Sherry Rikus and I'm with Stephen Rikus. We're husband and wife, if you don't know, and actually you're witnessing a first. This is our first time that we are doing a webinar together, so we hope you enjoy it. And this webinar came to us because at the beginning of COVID, we both looked at each other and said, boy, we're going to have all this time staying shelter in place. Let's clean our closet. And, and I don't know, did we get it done? No, not really. But um, one thing that we have done is we have cleaned our financial closet and we had some time at home to do that. And we thought we would give you some of our tips so that you can clean your financial closet as well. So that's what we are going to talk about today. So the first thing is what's in your financial closet? It's almost like when you clean your closet out, you just have to go through everything, lay everything out, see what you have. And that's the most important thing um, when you start to clean your financial closet is gather all those documents, all your financial documents, everything you have, and at least put it in one place so you can start cleaning. So today we're gonna to start to get your financial closet clean. We're gonna to start to revisit your budget, looking at your financial assets. Uh, we're very fortunate. Stephen was a state planning attorney for how many years? 15 years. 15 plus. Uh, he's gonna talk about some estate planning tips. We're gonna talk about just in case, God forbid something should happen to you, how would someone step in and take over your financial affairs? We're gonna talk about giving yourself some credit. Um, we can't have a webinar here without talking a little bit about investing. And my favorite topic, how to invest in yourself. So we are gonna begin right now and talk about cleaning up your spending. So when we meet with clients for the first time or we're starting to do their financial plan, we always ask our clients, how much are you spending? And what do we usually get, Stephen? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, or a blank look or a nervous look. So what, um, what we have to do, what we have to do is, sorry, there was a chat, just to make sure everyone was okay. Um, what you have to do is really look at your spending. And the first thing is your spending may have changed a lot during COVID. You know, you may not have traveled, of course, the dining out. So you need to go back to pre-COVID to look at your spending. And then one of my favorite topics is your values. I'm hearing time and time again that during COVID, a lot of people's values have changed. So you wanna really look at your spending and see, is it in line with your values? Are there things that maybe you didn't miss as much? Maybe cooking at home was a great joy or entertaining friends outside was fun for you instead of going to fancy dinners. Or maybe you started a workout routine and you wanna continue that. So look at your values and coordinate that with your spending. The other question we often get is what is a framework for my budget? And these are very general framework guidelines. So we're gonna start with the first guideline and I kind of call it, what does it cost to turn on the lights? And what are your basics? And your basics should be about 50%. So if you take your earnings and you look, I'm sorry, if you take your budget and you see what you spend, 50% should go towards your basics. That's your rent, your mortgage, your utilities, your groceries, your medical, transportation, or anything else that is completely non-negotiable. Now, you may want to live in, in a neighborhood that may be a little pricier, especially some of our young adults want a building with security, or you want to live in a home where prices are just very high and you want to be with good schools. So your basics percentage may go up to 55 or 60, but math is math. So if that basic percentage starts to creep up, then you might have to decrease your fun stuff. And again, it's your values. If your values are living in a certain location or at a certain home, then go up to 55, 60%, but you might need to decrease this to 20. So this is the fun stuff. This is really where you have to deep dig, look at your values, look at how you spent your time during COVID. Are there changes you wanna make? Are there things you used to spend money on that you don't? Um, some of the things, everyone has different values. Some people spend money on clothes. Some people love great meals. Some people love plays, vacations. 
I know, Stephen, you like looking good, right? No, I like a new bike. <laughs> oh, Stephen wants the new bike on here. So that's his value. And, and how did you decide that, Stephen? It fits with your values. Of being healthy. And in our budget. So um, Stephen had a big birthday and he is getting his new bike. So that's the fun stuff. So we've got 50%, 30%. So all everyone, if you can calculate it, the last one is 20%. And this is where your savings, paying down your debt, having money to charity. And again, everyone is different. You may have student loans you need to pay off. You may have a bigger um, car loans. Um, but at a minimum, you should take advantage of your 401k if you're working. And often 401k have a lot of benefits. First of all, it's money that's tax deferred. You don't have to pay taxes today on the money that you put in your 401k, but many companies have a match. So if you put a certain percentage in, they will match and that's kind of free money. So if you have young adults, we always tell um, the clients with their young adults, put in at least as much as a match. And that's a good way for young adults to start saving. But if you do you know, have debt, look at the percentage or the interest rate on it and try to pay the debt that is um, most expensive first. So those are the broad budget guidelines. Again, everyone is different. It has to add up to 100. So if you unfortunately have a lot of student loans, you might need to reduce the fun stuff. Or if your real estate costs more, you might have to reduce other areas of the market. So the next one is one of my favorite things. I'm kind of a nerd every quarter. I take my Excel spreadsheet and I make a list of all of my assets and all of our debt, and I come up with something called a net worth. And I high five myself if it's going up because we hope that it is. So how do you create your own and clean up your own balance sheet? Well, it's good for you to kind of gather all of your accounts, all of your bank accounts, all of your brokerage accounts, all of your retirement accounts. Um, if you have artwork or other valuables, put that on your spreadsheet. But this might be a time to clean things up. Um, some of you may have a dangling IRA from a job that you worked at 20 years ago that's just been sitting there, hasn't been watched. Maybe roll that into your IRA, consolidate it. Do you really need four different brokerage accounts? Consolidate that. Do you have money in several different banks? So try to clean this up so the next time you do your spreadsheet, it'll be a little easier. So this is on the asset front. So I know Stephen's favorite chart. And, and I think I still have his attention because during the practice, he kind of dozed off a little bit. So kudos to Stephen for staying awake here because he's on very shortly. But when you look at your overall assets, the biggest determinant of your success is something called an asset allocation. And an asset allocation is your mix of stocks and bonds. Stocks are your highest return, but often your higher risk. So you need to look at all of your investments in cash and see what percentage do you have in cash, what do you have in stocks, and what do you have in bonds? And is that allocation um, based on what your needs are today, based on your liquidity needs, your time horizon, and how much risk you're able to take? Uh, some You may wake up and you never kept track of this, and all of a sudden the stocks have gone up the last nine years. And you may have 90% of your money in stocks and you're now nine years older. Maybe that's not the right allocation. So at our firm, this is one of the, the big values that with our clients is we really work at helping them get their asset allocation. We come up with an investment policy statement for each client so they know their allocation. And we make sure that we rebalance and keep to that allocation so that there's not undue risks in the portfolio. I'd also wanna add, maybe some of you were very fortunate and you bought Apple or Amazon or some of these stocks that have gone up. Um, see how much exposure you have. You may have a bigger percentage of your portfolio in a couple stocks. And I know you don't like to pay taxes, but sometimes you need to reduce it and just get your portfolio in order. So that's on the asset side. The next part of your spreadsheet should be looking at all your debt. Look at your mortgage, your home equity lines, credit cards. I'll just add here. My advice is please, please pay off your credit cards every month. That's usually your highest interest debt. 
Um, also look at your home equity. Um, interest rates have risen. You might be paying more than you, excuse me, expect. So know what that interest rate is. And on your mortgage, um, you may have missed the boat this time, but there's often times when interest rates go low. So keep track of the interest rate you're paying on your mortgage. So look at your debt, look at the interest rates, have a plan, have a plan to pay down the debt that has the highest interest rates. And that's really on the debt side. So when you take the assets less your debt, that's something called your net worth. And I hope you will all track it. Um, I have a few housekeeping things before I turn it over to Stephen. One is if you do have questions, please put it in the Q&A and we will answer them at the end. And again, we are probably going over about 20 tips and we hope just like when you go to clean your closet, you don't do it in all one sitting. Hopefully you'll take two or three that will help you to start cleaning your financial closet. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen. So one of the things that is in your financial closet is your estate plan that consists of wills and trusts, healthcare powers of attorney. The first thing you know that we should do is find those documents. Just make sure you have them and you know where they are. The second thing is make sure that they were signed. I know this sounds kind of funny, but I had a client once who says, oh yeah, I did my estate plan seven years ago. They never could find their signed documents. So let's make sure you have those and get them organized in your healthcare power of attorney. Then when you look at your estate plan, you, you look at certain basic provisions. Make sure that the people who are getting the assets upon your passing are the people you want them to be. Make sure that your executors and trustees are the are people that you feel comfortable with. Listen, our relationships change over time. Um, look at your beneficiaries, your retirement plans, your insurance, um, and make sure that those beneficiaries are correct. Um, Sherry will tell a story about um, a time uh, with one client. Yeah, so we had a client who had worked at a company for 30 years, and um, unfortunately, he passed away suddenly, and this actually wasn't a client. It was a new client that was coming to us, and we were going through and getting her financial closet in order, and he had had his brother as the beneficiary. He had never changed it in all the years that he worked at the company. We helped her get things organized, but it was a lot of work, a lot of legal fees, a lot of legal time, so check those old beneficiaries and make sure that they're right, so. All right, um, and then we talk about accounts properly titled. You know, I know many of you have established revocable living trusts, yet they have never transferred assets into their um, into that trust. This is a time to look at your accounts and see what's been transferred in and what's not been transferred. For some of our clients, they've transferred everything except one asset. And going through your closet and looking at those assets, maybe it's a time to move that one asset into the name of your revocable trust. Um, another thing is this in your financial closet is your, you know, is your insurance, you know, do you have, um, uh, make sure you have car insurance, make sure you have your property insurance, make sure you have all that information and that you know what it is, you know how much um, 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 property insurance, liability insurance you have. And the last one, which is Sherry's favorite is. Wait, can we go back to the insurance? Absolutely. Sorry, because we, we're doing this for the first time together, but. Often we find clients insured their home when they bought the home or 20 years ago. And fortunately, a lot of homes increased in value. So make sure that your home, your jewelry, your artwork, anything of value is properly insured because that's so important. Absolutely. And then once the sure would say, um, leave a legacy, pass your values to your, to your beneficiaries in addition to your valuables. Another big item that's in the in your um, financial closet is your health care power of attorney. And this is the document where you designate one person to make financial uh, make health care decisions on your behalf in the event um, that you are unable to do so. And so what's important about in that financial closet, make sure you know where it is and make sure your agent has access to this form. Um, you know, the last thing you want to do, you're in the hospital, your agent runs, it runs to the hospital to make this decision. They say, where's your health care? Uh, where's, the, where's the document? And your agent doesn't know where it is. As a matter of fact, we generally recommend that your agent should have a copy of it on his or her phone as, as, as an emergency document. The other thing that's important is um, making sure your uh, young adults, your children over 18, have a health care power of attorney. Um, oftentimes, it's something that gets overlooked. And we actually have a personal story uh, involving uh, healthcare powers. So some of you um, on here may know our daughter, Isabel, and she's go big or go home. And she decided she's 
pretty much skied for about a couple of years, but she was going to go down the Black Diamonds and it didn't go as well as planned. Uh, she ended up tearing her ACL. Uh, fortunately, she lives in Denver and there's a lot of doctors that are very capable of fixing torn ACLs. But she went to the hospital and uh, called me on the way and I said, call me when you're there. But she was with friends and she gets in the car and she called me from the car and said, mom, I need surgery. And I said, well, what kind of surgery would the doctor say? And she says, I don't know, we talked a lot, but, but here's his number, give him a call. And we called the doctor and um, you know, it was easier. We just sent the healthcare power because we wanted the system to have it, but it was glad that we had that healthcare power of attorney. So fortunately she was conscious, she could talk. I could have gotten her on the phone, but you know, it's almost easier to send the healthcare than getting your child back on the phone. But um, anyway, make sure that you're young adults. And if you, know, you don't have time to go to your attorney, um, what's a, a quick and easy way that we can get the young adults the healthcare power of attorney? You know, you can Google online, Illinois Healthcare Power of Attorney. There's a statutory forum. And if you can't find it online, please feel free to reach out to Sherry or I, and um, we, will, we will get you the form to fill out. Okay, just in case. You know, there is so much information that if, if something were to happen, you would be coming to pass date or you pass away, that your successor fiduciaries, your fiduciaries would need. Whether it's what statements do you own? Where, who's your attorney? Who's your accountant? Um, what are your burial instructions? What are the passwords to your, and your logins to your uh, to your accounts online? So we like we recommend that our clients keep this information in their financial closet, obviously someplace secure, and that you tell your um, your fiduciaries, your children, your fiduciaries where that information is. Um, for our clients, some of us give us a copy that we we maintain that information, um, and we have this form that we call, we've made our own form called a just in case form, which is available on rrcapital.com if you if you want to look at it. But it really um, it's nothing special. It's just listing all. It the is different special because we did it. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just a place for you to list all your information in one place, which is which is you know very important to make life easier when you pass. And, and if you've gone through, unfortunately, a death in the family, it's a very stressful time as it is. So the more um, you can be organized, the more that your family is organized, that can take a little stress out of a very tough situation. Okay. And as most of you know, fraud is on the rise. So in your financial closet should be a copy of your credit report. And we recommend you updating that once a year, annualcreditreport.com, it's free. Take a look at it and make sure there's nothing on there that you don't recognize. Um, uh, you can do it more often than once a year, but once a year is, I think it's just fine. Um, unless you've had some, uh, some hacks, you know, some breaches, then perhaps you can do it more often. And finally, financial safety. And this is, you know, a lot of the, the more in depth or the um, stuff that's inside your financial closet. Um, we recommend you looking at your life insurance. How much life insurance do you coverage do you have? When does it run out? A lot of you have purchased, a lot of our um, individuals have purchased level term policies where the, where the premiums increase at a specific time. Um, just know those numbers, know what your disability insurance is. Know what your, if you have long-term care, know what the policy is. Um, we recommend that you review your um, brokerage statements. Um, we recommend individuals have a backup um, credit card. In I there. think of this as kind of like your little backup black dress. So if you get invited to a party last minute, you have it. And I know you've got a backup outfit too, right, Stephen? Blue pinstripe suit. You got it. Okay. It's always there. Um, just in case if your heart card gets hacked, that way you have a, a backup card. Um, watch for fraud alerts. I mean, I know this is kind of, this might be, uh, you know this, but uh, when you get a fraud alert, don't click the link in the fraud alert, go directly to, you know, the, the websites. If you get a fraud alert from Chase, don't click on that fraud alert, go to the Chase website and, and visit. There. They're getting really good at that. We've had a couple people call us about that. And Sherry's a big proponent of making sure you have an emergency fund. If you need money, if you need $25,000 on an emergency basis, where are you going to get it? It could be you have cash on hand. It could be you have a line of a home equity line of credit. Um, it might be from a relative, but make sure that you know that if you need an emergency source of funds, you know where that source is. And now Sherry gets to finish okay. with her favorite topic. Okay, a couple more topics. So, you know, just like as you're going through your closet, you're deciding, should I keep this dress that I loved? Um, am I going to keep you know, I decided I have my wedding gown in a box, so I'm keeping some sentimental items. 
But probably one of the questions that we get often, and I don't just get this from our clients because our clients know. Our clients know to be disciplined and, and to live through the ups and downs in the market. But people who know I'm in the business uh, at a cocktail party, playing tennis, wherever I am, people always ask, should I continue to own stocks? And especially now, unfortunately, we have some very difficult times and things going on in the world. So what's on people's mind a lot is should I own stocks? So this is the time that we're gonna see. Um, hopefully you're still engaged and I have a little quiz and um, the book is back here. I wrote a book that was out in June called Maximize Your Return on Life. Some of you may already have it, but we are gonna give two books away to the person that gets the closest to this question. And if you already have the book, don't click it yet. If you already have the book, then um, you're welcome to share it with a friend. So the question is, if you invested a dollar in 1970, what would the value of that dollar be today in 2020? I don't have the 2021 up, but in 2020. So a dollar that was invested, and you put this in the chat, in the global equity market. So that was in the US and international stock market. If you had a dollar in 1970, what would it be worth today? And I also want to say, um, in nine, if you invested in 1970, in 1973-74, the market went down 43% in that 18-month period. So your dollar went down quite a bit right away. So I've got a couple. I've got $5. I've got $20. Um, any more guesses? Keep going. I'll, I'll give you about 30 more seconds. Uh, we've got, uh, I, I can't, my eyes are bad. I think we've got two, $230 or $230. 230. Um, we've got 1000 2000 Okay, I'm going to show you where we're at. And Jennifer is going to document the people that are closest and she'll email you to get your address for the book. So a dollar in 1970, you've got five seconds, would be $69 today. So $1,000 in 1970 would be $69,000 a day. So we had guesses going from $5 to 1,500. But look at this, um, you know, market was down 43% right after 1970. We had 9-11, we had uh, the dot-com crash. I don't know, I remember where I was on Black Friday in 1987, the Dow dropped 23% in one day, Brexit, S&P was down 46% during the mortgage crisis. But living through all this, you get $69 and there's a lot of emotions that happened in all these down markets, but staying the course really helped. And that's always interesting to me how much a dollar has grown over that time period. Um, this is another chart that I absolutely love and it makes being a financial advisor so fun. This shows going back to 1926, the blue is the up markets, the red is the down markets. So fortunately in our business, there's a lot more blue, a lot more bull markets than there is bear markets or down markets. And what usually happens after these down markets is that there's long periods of bull markets and you never know when that's gonna happen. Um, a most recent example was COVID, March of 2020. You can see at the very end, the market went down and we've more than recovered that. So um, again, this is another reason why we advise our clients to stay disciplined. And sometimes it's always good to look back at history. So we've talked about the growth of a dollar. We've talked about history. And often we get asked, well, I understand markets go up over time, but there are these red and down periods. So can't you just help me time it? Can I just pull out until things look better and then I'll get back in? And it sounds like a great concept, but I have yet to find anyone that can time the market successfully and we've done a little research on this I wanna share with you. So if we go back to 1990 to 2020, so 30 years, the S&P 500, which is the broad-based US market index was up 10.23%. I hope the next 10 years we're up that, but who knows, but hopefully we will, but that is a great return over the 30 year period. 
But if you miss the 15 best days, so you tried to time the market, and we never know when these days are going to come. We've seen it recently, market up 600, market down 300. But you miss the 15 best days during that time period, you're giving up 4%. 4% is a lot of return in our world. That might be the difference of helping a grandchild with their college expenses, taking big family vacations, a second home, a medical um, emergency with one of your family members. That excess return by trying to time the market really um, will come into handy when you need that in the long run. So I hope that you will stay disciplined during these very difficult times not try to uh, time the market, but go back to what I said a few moments ago. Make sure that you have an asset allocation that is right for you based on your goals, your liquidity needs, and your risk tolerance. And a lot of people say, well, I would have just been happy being in cash. One month T-bills, which is a proxy for cash, is 2.64%, almost an 8% difference. So make sure that you have an asset allocation and that you do own stocks in some portion of your portfolio. Um, this is, um, I like those other charts. This has been my all time favorite chart. If you've been on my webinars, you've seen this before. I call it the quilt. It's suitable for framing. So you're welcome to reach out to me. I will give you a copy, but there's a lot of numbers and a lot of colors. So I wanna spend just a few moments to explain this to you. What we have here is all of these boxes represent areas of the stock market. You can see all the boxes here. The US large company stock is the blue box. That's most of the S&P 500 stocks, a lot of the Amazon, Netflix, Google, Apple, those are part of large company stocks. But there's also small company stocks, there's real estate is this purplish color, burgundy, um, international is more of the yellow, emerging markets, that's the undeveloped foreign markets and the blue, and then you have fixed income. So what you can do is if you just take a step back, squint your eyes, I've had mathematicians, I've had actuaries trying to find the pattern. And what you see right off the bat, there is no pattern. Every year, there's another area of the market that's on the top and another area that's on the bottom and a lot in between. But one of my favorite examples is 2008. That was that mortgage crisis where you can see all down here, the US stock market was down 37%. The international markets were down 40 and emerging markets down here, the, the blue was down 53%. So what did a lot of investors do? They said, I'm done, I gotta get out and I am going to sell my emerging markets for sure because I've lost half my value and maybe some of the international. But the next, um, the next year in 2009, the US stock market was up 26.5%. So everyone was so happy, but look what happened. Emerging markets was up 80%, international was up 50% or more. So our whole goal is not only should you have a proper asset allocation that meets your individual goals and objectives, but within the stock and bond piece, you should be fully diversified with both US and international bonds and US and international stocks. So that's why we think diversification really can enhance your returns and reduce your risk over time. So we've talked a lot about history, diversification, but one thing that is very hard to control is emotions and emotions can get the best of us and investing is very emotional. And I kind of equate this chart here about emotions going back to your sixth grade crush. Um, I remember mine, I wrote a blog about it. He read the blog, he contacted me, sorry, Stephen. You weren't my sixth grade crush, but we've been married almost 33 years. But anyway, uh, your sixth grade crush, um, you start, you're very optimistic, your crush likes you, you get excited, but then you hear in the rumors during the lunch, maybe your crush likes someone else, you get nervous, then you're fearful, maybe you start to like someone else, your crush comes back, but this is just like investing, you know, you're all excited, the market is up, it can go on forever, and then there's some bad news, a company misses their earnings by one cent, and markets start to come down, you get nervous, you're fearful, you hang in there and then you get optimistic. So just try to control your emotions 
And all I know is that sixth graders are going to have emotional first crushes and investors are always going to have emotional times during certain periods of the stock market and, and what's going on in the economy. So manage your emotions. The other thing that often gets in the way is news. Newspapers are here to sell papers, CNN, CNBC, they're here to get viewership and they exaggerate a lot of things that are happening. It's news. They need to report on something. And there's all these things that get flying around. Dow's down 500 points. We have a great housing market. We have a horrible housing market. Buy these five funds. It's time to buy gold. All of these headlines are always in the back of our mind and people are talking about it a lot. Just stay disciplined. No one knows your uh, situation, what's right for you. Have a plan that works for you and try to get the emotions out of it and all the news and all the headlines. So the last thing that I love to invest, just like you invest in that great outfit for your closet, I want you to invest in yourself. And a lot of the principles in my book, Maximizing Your Return on Life, talks a lot about that, but it starts with your values. And again, I have a list of values if anyone wants it. Um, it's on one of the blogs too on our website, rrcapital.com. But take some time, think about what's important to you. Your values, like I said before, may have changed during COVID. Share them with your significant other, family members, so that everyone knows what's your values. And I'm going to end this with my dad's favorite quote. And I'll tell a quick story. It goes down when I was 16. I got my first job. I got my paycheck. I was all excited. And Bruce Springsteen was coming to town. And I also wanted fry boots. The first startling part when I got my paycheck was all the deductions. But nonetheless, I had my paycheck. And I didn't have enough for both. So we were at dinner. And I was talking to my dad. And I thought, if I tell him my dilemma, what's he going to say? Oh, you pay for Springsteen, I'll get you the fry boots. That's what I thought would happen, but that didn't happen. This was one of my big life lessons. He looked at me and he said, you can have anything you want, not everything. So pick what's most important. For those thinking about it, I picked Bruce Springsteen, still love Bruce Springsteen till this day. And I think I realized I'm an adventure experience type person. Um, just fast forward many, many years, it's... Um, we were visiting with my daughter and I actually went to buy my daughter a pair of boots for her birthday and they ended up being fry boots. So I told her the story again. So remember, invest in yourself. You can have anything you want, not everything. And I think that concludes our session, but we do have some, um, there's some links on here if uh, if you want. And also, um, if there, there's some links on what we talked about, and we're happy to answer any questions. If anyone has questions, please put it in the Q&A. And thank you for joining us. We are going to be trying to do these webinars once a month, and uh, we are recording it. So if there's someone that you know that might want to clean their financial closet, we'll give a link um, in the next few weeks on the webinar. Any questions? No questions. I know we talked about a lot of stuff. Any parting words, Stephen? No parting words. So no questions here. Well, thank you. Enjoy your day. And we hope that we maximized um, your return on lunch. Thank you. <laughs>